So you love podcasts and you want to listen to more amazing content, but you have no idea what to listen to. And your friends keep telling you about great episodes, yet you can never remember what they told you. Well, here's the answer. Good Pods. It's the social app dedicated to podcasts where your friends, podcast listeners, and favorite podcast hosts all come together to share on their feeds what they recommend and what they listen to. You can connect to others, bookmark episodes, start a conversation about the episode, connect to the hosts, and most importantly, listen to great podcasts right in the Good Pods app. Download Good Pods wherever you get your apps and start sharing with a community that loves to listen. Good Pods, it's where to connect and listen. So here's how it works. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed, and you believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you listen to Thrive Loud, and Lou shows you how deep the rabbit hole goes. What are you waiting for? It's time to Thrive Loud. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond, connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. Today on Thrive Loud, we have a man who believes that anything is possible. He is the president and founding member of IF Management, a company with a focus of coaching and motivating others to become the best version of themselves. He is also the author of Don't Take Yes for an Answer a self-empowerment guide to achieving your fullest professional and personal potential. Thrive Loud listeners, someone I've known for a very long time and you're all going to enjoy hearing from, Steve Hers. Steve, how are you today? I'm good, Lou. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for that kind introduction. Yes, I am being kind. You know, I've actually fortunately known Steve for a while. He is an unbelievable professional. Our paths have crossed here in New York in many different ways and lights. And it's very true. This is someone who's always thinking forward and moving forward and coming up with the best of what you can make something out of. And I think it would be great, Steve, for me to pass the mic to you to talk a little bit maybe about your general business sense and the way you think about things, because it is without a doubt for somebody who is an attorney by profession, one of the more positive, inspiring guys I've ever come across. So can I pass the baton to you and share a little bit of uh, the magic of who you are? Well, thank you, Lou. That's very kind. Yes. So basically, uh, giving you my backstory, I, I was a lawyer. It's, it's, it's um, in the very early part of the book. I talk about how I was working at this law firm in 1990 called Curtis Malay Prevost on Park Avenue in New York and came to the end of the summer, my second summer in law school, and was told by the managing partner of the summer associate position that I was an abysmally bad summer associate and that I should um, not even continue to think about being a lawyer. I should re- not even finish my third year of law school and I should quit and go do something else and become a business owner or a client of their firm more in the sales area. And the guy who told me this, his name was Turner Smith, was such a decent, nice guy that you couldn't be angry with him for relaying such a harsh message because he meant it in the most kind way and thoughtful way. And he really changed the entire trajectory of my life. And I ended up leaving the law and, and went into the talent business where I've been for the last, almost the last 30 years and representing sportscasters, newscasters, TV weathermen, et cetera. And I think what I've really sort of learned most importantly is that an agent is good. And obviously I like to think that I'm important, but it's the client. It's, it's their work ethic. It's their effort. It's their ability to f- form and, and maintain and develop and grow relationships that are going to be the key to their success. So to the extent that I've had any success in my career, it's been in picking the right people to represent in the first place who had those qualities and coaching them in maybe some of the areas that they were a little bit weaker in and helping to ameliorate those issues and help them grow in the areas that they already had some strengths in. And I tried over the last four years to take that experience and that, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, wisdom that I've accrued 
and apply it in, in a larger world with doctors and lawyers and dentists and bankers and just regular people. And, and that's how this book came about. And that's what it's really all about. And I could tell you more, but that's yeah. a little bit of the introduction. Let's dive into this. For, uh, first of all, I want to ask just from your entrepreneurial hat, um, leading, being a good salesperson and a good uh, front running business person versus leading a team. Uh, share with the listeners some of the early lessons maybe that you went through, because obviously, look, you can recruit some of the best clients. You are very personable type of guy, which is must, must have been what your uh, attorney mentor had mentioned to you. But running a business is a whole other thing. Talk about the challenge or balance as you were starting a company and maybe the drive that you have on how you took that leadership to move the company forward. It's a good question. And it's funny. It's something I've really thought about a lot lately. And this word leadership is often you know, talked about and defined. And I think that I have a bit of a different definition of leadership than other people do. It doesn't, my definition does accompany things that others talk about motivating and, um, and what you think about in the traditional leadership. But I think it's also about recruiting. It's about recruiting. I, I think you really have to recruit the best people to be on your team. And you also have to be willing when is necessary to tell people on that team that they don't really have a place on the team and you can, you know, give them warnings of course and be kind to them. And look, I have been fortunate that I haven't had to fire a lot of people over my career, but I have. And I think that if you think about perhaps the best things I've done, it has been firing some of those people because it it sent a message to the rest of the team. Hey, you're being recognized for doing the things you are doing. Uh, Others that aren't doing them, for whatever reason, don't have the right work ethic or just the right skill set, aren't going to be part of this team because they're going to bring you down. And I think in a weird way, it can energize others. So it's about recruiting those people. And then, of course, nurturing those relationships. And I think that what I've done, and again, it's, it's not necessarily for everybody, but I've certainly crossed the lines in terms of, you know, to friendship from just a business relationship. The people that work for me, Many of them have become my closest friends. We, we see each other socially on weekends. I socialize with their spouses and vice versa. They, they've just become a, an integral part of my life. And I think that if you have a mutual respect with people, then you can breach those lines and it can still work. I, I like what you said. This is really interesting. And it's so important as a leader to know when to say no to someone, meaning like, no, you're not going to be the right fit. And that's something uh, people sometimes don't want to say to their teams or the, the harshness, or if you build up that rapport, if they aren't going to be the right fit to, to end the ties there. And I find this interesting because I'm always about get to know faster. You, on the other hand, are actually about not taking yes for an answer. Can you explain a little bit about the title of your book and this methodology that you have behind it? Yes, um, or no, no. <laughs> I knew that was, I was, somebody would bump that spike on the volleyball game there to Sorry. make that work. Thank you for taking that up. <laughs> of course. So the, 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 the title of the book comes from really an observation that I've been making about myself and about others for many, many years. And I think that there's a, a very important foundational quality that a person has to have in order to reach his or her potential. And that quality is, it's, it's, it's a level of humility that goes beyond just being humble, not thinking you're great or something like that. It's, it's more about a desire to improve and a desire to really seek out constructive feedback in your life, not every day, not every minute, And certainly there is a lot of room and there should be room in your life both to give and receive positive feedback, but it can't be the only thing. And often it it drowns out anything else in our lives. And so I think that a really good leader is willing to give people or not give people a yes when they don't deserve it. But more importantly, I think in a culture and from the individual standpoint, hopefully the person that reads this book, it's not called don't give yes for an answer, although that's important. It's called don't take yes for an answer. So it's about you, the individual.
individual to say to yourself, look, wherever I am in my life, if I'm not at the place where I want to be, what am I doing that I could be doing differently that I'm not hearing from others externally that I could seek out to find out about myself that I could seek to improve? And often, once you get that diagnosis, so to speak, the fix is actually really easy. But we never get the diagnosis because, like I say in the book, you end up in this ecosystem and an echo chamber of yes because of some really significant societal changes over the last 30 years. I'll just give them to you really quickly. Yeah. One is the participation trophy culture. The second is grade inflation. And the third is HR departments in most, if not many, or many, if not most, American businesses, no longer really firing people, just downsizing or reorg or euphemistically letting people go. So the end user, the individual who really tried hard and maybe really is doing a lot of things right, but has a few significant flaws, doesn't even know what they are. So I, what I say is you can get up, caught up in the vortex of mediocrity. And by the way, Lou, yeah. anybody can get caught up in that. Even a high achiever can do it. Could be, remember, mediocrity is defined as whatever, however far away you are from your potential. Can I, let's, let's dive a little bit in this because I think this is great. And let's do quick bullet points on each one of those three. And I totally agree with where this is going, but I want to see how it leads to that. Don't take, don't take yes for an answer. First, the participation trophies. Can you share your thoughts on this. I want to hear this one. So, you know, that, that was really driven home by my, my son, who's now 11. Um, he's very small. And he, he, he really doesn't like competition. He doesn't want to play organized sports because he's barely on the weight chart for his age group. And I understand that. So we, we finally got him to enroll in a, uh, in a basketball, I don't know what you want, clinic, if you want to call it. It wasn't even a competitive game. And they would, they would end a lot of these games, uh, th- these clinics, with maybe a 20-minute game, you know, three on three or whatever. And almost – very, very minimal competition, right? And then, of course, like anything else, there were some really good players and some really not so good players. And, you know, frankly, he wasn't really all that good. But it was to be expected. He just didn't have the physical tools that other kids did. But at the end of every uh, game, every kid got the same exact ribbon or or trophy, whatever it was they gave out. Mm -hmm. And he came home with a giant smile on his face, which is good. And he felt like he was LeBron James and didn't really even have any recognition, frankly, that he was not as good as the other kids. Yeah. And I, I think it, it I, I'm, you know, it's, it's a very fine line we're walking here, but the, I don't, I wish we could keep the positivity of feeling good about oneself and also somehow come across with the message because you will find out later in life, you're not LeBron James. And that, that's what's being obscured, I think, quite often with the participation trophy culture. It's really funny you, you mentioned that because I actually uh, call it the earning the trophy versus being given the trophy uh, is, is a real big differentiator. I remember as a kid, I strived to try to win and get the trophy, and it was what pushed me. And it is a good point. If I was always going to be given one, would I – would I ever strive as much as you could? And, and that's a great point that not everybody has. Some people have that natural competitiveness to keep wanting to grab more. But if you encourage that mediocrity, which I guess is a key environment, um, you will take yes for an answer. And I totally get that. That is, it's, it's, and it's, so the question is, is that changing? And what can we do to change it? I, I don't know, frankly, on a, on a global sense, a broad sense, if it's changing. I, I think it's changing in pockets. I think people have come to realize this. And I think parents are wise to say to their children, look, you, you earned a participation trophy, but you didn't earn an MVP trophy. And if you want to be great at something, you should aspire to an MVP trophy. Now, the problem is, is that they don't give out an MVP trophy in many circles. Yeah. So you can't even earn that either up until maybe ever. I mean, a lot of schools have eliminated the valedictorian even. So even academically, you don't know where you stand. But I, I think a lot of people are wise to this. And hopefully, you know, frankly, my book and my message gets out there and other people like it and are attracted to it and feel that it's important for them to relay also. 
Steve, the writing process is an interesting one and every author, and I've interviewed hundreds of them, have different ways that they went through the writing process. Uh, this is your first book, yes? This is the first publication you've done? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. What was it like, your writing process? Was it one of those, you were very scheduled and structured and sat down and had it, or you put pen to paper when the ideas hit? Well, I, it's funny. I, I started off with this book. It was a, it was a lark. I was a lark, but four years ago, I was almost turning 50 and I decided I wanted to, like I said, get this message out to broader audience. I decided to start doing some speaking on it. Was very lucky to get hired by a big bank and a few other organizations and giving a speech at a bank one day uh, on ironically, International Women's Day. Why they hired a man, I don't know, but they did. And a woman <laughs> got up and, and, and said, I love your message. Can I buy two copies of your book? And I said, I don't have a book. And she said, well, you should write one. And that was literally how it happened. So I went home, talked to my wife about it. And she said, go write a book. And I said, okay. She said, no, no, go write a book. Go write a book right now while the ideas are in your head. So I went literally to the kitchen in our apartment and started typing out on a laptop. And I had a lot of notes that I obviously was using for the speech and also a lot of notes that I kept from 25 years of being an agent. And I was able to just write four chapters off the top of my head, basically, with those notes. And the next day, I dropped my kids off at school, ran to a mom, and she told me about this agent I should talk to, went and met with the agent. The agent liked me, liked the idea, signed me, but she said, look, with all due respect, you're not a professional writer. So I want to pair you up with a, uh, with a ghost writer. So I paired up with a ghost writer. And so I worked with a ghost writer through, through the process. And basically I would write the ideas down. I would email, um, it was a woman in, in Austin, Texas, and she would, you know, basically transcribe and, 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 and edit. And then what, what was challenging about this is that this book went through two incarnations. One was just was rejected, frankly, by the publisher, and, and rightly so, which was just a, more of a book about interviews with other people. And then it was taking those interviews and really turning it into a full narrative. And the, the ghostwriter, um, her name is Stephanie Land. I have to say she did an amazing job, uh, amazing job. And I thank her profusely in the book. She took the time to really, really understand uh, these concepts. She embodied them herself throughout the process. And I don't think this book would have been nearly as good without her help. In the, if there was one, I, I've asked this question about writers. Writers go in to write a book and, and they have a great idea and specifically thought leaders like yourself and those that obviously are, have been successful in the profession, they, they look at the book in a different way than maybe more the creative or the fiction writer would. Is there one takeaway that when the book was finished, that was a surprise that maybe someone else read or they took something from the content that really surprised you more so as, as what the output of, you know, you put something in, something, a message comes out, but how people interpret it. Was there any surprises either to you or to anyone that's, uh, that's read it in the process? Yeah, there, there were quite a few surprises. Um, you know, look, the book is interesting. I've, I've, I've been able to, the publisher allowed me to give out some galley copies to some reviewers and influencers and media people. And so I've, I've had, a, a, I don't know, probably 50 people have read it and some people have really loved it. They have absolutely loved it. And that's really obviously rewarding. You know, other people like anything else, maybe it didn't uh, resonate with them quite as much that happens. And then there was a few people that really came and hit me with some very you know good feedback and questioned some of the things and challenged me on some of the things. And what, What's really interesting is that after I talked it out with a couple of these people, it it was it wasn't that it, the book was diminished, but they didn't really understand the message as it was intended. So that was challenging, and and will be hopefully something I can rectify in speaking and in supplementary things as as the book gets more traction. But the other thing that was surprising is that. In doing the research for the book and in interviewing people to try to really um, kind of bring home and, and make bring alive a lot of these concepts, I interviewed, like I said, a lot of people and some quite famous people in different successful walks of life. But one guy I interviewed was not particularly famous or, I mean, he was successful, but nobody knew who he was. 
and he was a guy who had been morbidly obese and he ended up becoming a very, very top executive at Citibank. And people loved his story. I would say of all the stories in the book, his story resonated the most with, with, with everybody, which surprised me. It's very cool. And it's fun because I always think that that's the best part of when, you know, like you put something out there and how it connects to other people is always interesting. So I, I guess I look at it this way, Steve, uh, you've been a successful entrepreneur. You, you're, you have a, a company that's done really well. You've represented some incredible leaders. You've put together a book. You have a great message. You are a motivational and in, inspirational person. Yet like each of us, we all have days when we're not kicking on all cylinders. When you, Steve, have trouble thriving, who or what practice do you seek to get back on the thriving track? Well, for me personally, there's two things that I do. And it's interesting because this uh, period of confinement has really brought that home. Uh, One, I work out. It's very, very helpful to me. Um, Even if it's a half an hour on an elliptical machine, I just recently had hip replacement, so I can't run anymore. And, um, you know, it, it, it just, it, it's, it's like a bizarre reset button. You know, I, I'll do like a high intensity 30 minutes listening to Aerosmith and screaming at the top of my lungs. And it just gives me, it's like almost like restarting your computer. Um, and then the second thing I do is I write and I don't care how bad it is and I don't care if nobody <laughs> wants to read it. Um, it's just, even if it's just writing some philosophy, I wrote something about Passover the other day and I posted it on LinkedIn. And I, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's really not with an idea that it's going to become the great American novel. It's more about just getting my head clear. And like you say, being able to thrive because it's not easy waking up every day and feeling that sense of motivation. Kick yourself, and I like that. I could, and it's interesting. Uh, I didn't even know that you were that big of a runner. I had no idea about that. It was very cool to to learn that about you. And and are you still run? Obviously, not now running outside, but are you normally still running and, and racing? No, no. I mean, I, like I said, I I had hip surgery in September on my right hip, which was really horribly arthritic, and uh, my left hip is horribly arthritic, and I'll be having surgery as soon as they open up the hospitals again. But I don't, I don't care. I I still do. Um, you know, Peloton and uh, rowing and, and everything else but running. And it's probably just better off for me at this point in my life anyway, not to run because I still am able to work out. Steve, let's do this. Uh, let's do the admin part of the show here. Share with the listeners all the places people can find you, where they can get the book, URLs, links. We will put all of it in the show notes, but it always gets more engagement when they hear it from you. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm new to Instagram and enjoying it. That's uh, <laughs> Steve. Hers 66, my year of birth, on Instagram, S T E V E H E R Z 66. On Twitter, it's S T E V E N H E R Z, Stephen Hers. So those are two big places. And then I'm also on LinkedIn, um, just my name, Stephen Hers. Um, and you can look up, I'm now part of a company called the Montag Group. And also, if management, you can find me there. And on Facebook, uh, Stephen Hers. So I'm trying to post all these messages. In, in, in those places and, you know, just trying to do some video and getting the message out and hoping that it resonates with people. And Steve, more importantly, when is the book launch coming out so we can make sure we promote it at the right time? Uh, sure. It's June 16th. And also, just so you know, Lou, the, there is a, a, a book website that people can look up if they want to pre-order or get information on it. And that's just www.stevenherz.com, S-T-E-V-E-N-H-E-R-Z.com. Perfect. We and anyone put, who wants, they can email me, you know, if they have more questions right from there. We will put all those links in the show notes and make sure that everybody knows it and gets a chance to check it out. Along these lines, Steve, uh, we're going to have to take you down Fun Street, if it's okay. It's something we do here on Thrive Loud. Sure. Steve, if you could, share with us your all-time favorite movie. You know, it, it's a good question. I, I, I'm going to go off the board here and say it's a, an old war movie called Breaker Morant with Brian Brown about the, uh, the Boer War in South Africa. I saw it in a film class at the University of Michigan. I found it really haunting and a, and a, a really interesting message about life. What was, the, what was the main thing that connected with you? What was that message about life that it delivered? I mean, just about how, you know, um, it's almost like you could say in a, in a much better way, no good deed goes unpunished mm-hmm. about a guy who 
you know, volunteers for the war and I don't want to spoil it for you, but how, you know, that, that ends up for him. Got it. Is there a certain song or jam that you're listening to right now as we're in the midst of COVID-19 that you're working out on or Pelotoning on that is your go-to to get yourself motivated and move yourself forward? I'm going to embarrass myself with your audience, but it's uh, Fleetwood Mac, The Chain. That's a great song, though. That's not embarrassing yourself. It really goes up to a great <laughs> I know. No, it's a spectacular song. You know, okay, had, good. All right, all right, all right. had you said like, you know, Sesame Street's Rubber Ducky, I think then we would have had a whole different conversation. But I think we're OK, knowing that that's a pretty classic rock and roll song. So very cool. I love it. Uh, la- last question here. And that is, look, uh, give a message to our listeners here. Like we're recording this in early April. Uh, unsettling times everywhere you happen to live in New York City. And right at this moment, we're like at the peak of, of the severity of this, this uh, pandemic. Uh, to somebody that's always thinking about moving forward and someone who really has an important message, what message do you want to give to listeners to kind of make them say, hey, moving forward, how should I be thinking about my business, my life, my persona? What should I be doing? What's the right mindset to get in, Steve? I think this is an amazing, amazing opportunity for a lot of people to improve themselves. You have, most of us have a lot more free time. We're not commuting. Um, our jobs are, many of them, you know, diminished. So I'd say that take the opportunity to better yourself. And part of my book, which we didn't really talk about, is just the real importance of good communication. And what I talk about in the book called Awe, Authority, Warmth, and Energy, Your Voice, Your Body Language, Your Demeanor. And there's a million free um, videos on YouTube or whatever to improve your voice, improve your body language, improve your listening skills. Take this time right now to improve yourself. It's not that hard and it's free. So watch TED Talks, you know, really do a little bit of an honest self-evaluation of where you've been struggling in your life and take this. This is like an incredible moment for you to, to take the time to better yourself. Steve Harris, perfect message for our, for our show here today. And I couldn't agree more with you. Wanted to thank you for coming on the program. And uh, hey, don't take yes for an answer. We'll put all the links to it. And thanks again for coming on the program, man. Thank you, Lou. Really appreciate it. And to all our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And until next time, keep thriving onward and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, be gone. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Check us out on the web at thriveloud.com and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at Thrive Loud. And check us out on the Good Pods app at Thrive Loud, where you can follow, listen, and connect directly to Lou and all of the Thrive Loud episodes. Thanks for listening.